today's topic, we're going to talk about uh, seven uh, stages in a sales process. I'm going to do a quick screen share here for you and uh, take you through a presentation that I've assembled this morning uh, just based on uh, some information that I've been gathering over the past couple of years. I happen to really like Brian Tracy and his content around sales. And there's one particular book out of probably, I don't know, 50, 80 of his. The Psychology of Selling is one in particular that I've uh, spent a little bit of time in and have used sort of as a, I'll call it a table of contents for today to just basically follow a structure and an agenda. But I've also gone out and found lots of other information and other content around the topics that he covers in these seven steps of a sales process. So I'm gonna include a link to this PDF into the chat box before the call is done today so you all have a copy of this. And um, it's full of hyperlinks to all the places I found lots of sources around these topics. So Brian Tracy suggests that there are seven stages to a sales process. And you have to think of these seven as digits in a phone number, is the way he describes it. These are key processes that you must file, must follow, and you must dial in all seven of them to be successful in, in sales. Uh, it all starts with good prospecting, and a lot of us probably struggle with prospecting. It's one of the toughest things to do. Um, we're going to go through each of these seven. I've got about a minute per slide, and I'm actually going to set myself a timer so that I uh, stay on stay on task and stay on target here and be done with this in a less than 15 minutes. So uh, prospecting is really where you start. Uh, you need to build rapport with your prospects as you're nurturing them through the process. You need to really identify their needs, and I think a lot of businesses fail at um, taking the extra time to identify needs of their prospects, and some of us do it really well. Um, when you do a presentation, eventually you'll only present what really makes sense based on the customer's needs if you're having the most successful presentations. You need to learn to overcome some objections and not stop on the first objection that comes up, and you need to practice various closing techniques and find out of a handful of closing techniques which ones work well for you. And referrals become part of an engine of ongoing work. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time diving into each of these seven topics. Under the prospecting step, you could spend two hours a day for a month and study prospecting and not exhaust all of your possibilities in prospecting. Um, it starts though by understanding who is the best customer for you. Not everybody is a great client necessarily. So the very first step of understanding an ideal prospect and building a profile for that ideal prospect uh, if you do some some research, you'll find, um, look for the word persona, search for, you know, buyer personas, you'll find a way to tie a name to an individual um, that meets a model customer for you, the ideal perfect customer for you. Um, you may have two or three people, you may have a Betty and you might have a John and you might have a James, um, individuals that you target your sales to and each of those individual names are, are very unique customers. It's one way to think of that. Um, find ways that you meet their, um, how you're gonna meet those ideal prospects. Learn how to work your call list. And I know cold calling is one of the scariest things for almost every business owner. So um, I'm gonna show you a technique here in, a, in another slide or two about how to overcome some call reluctance. I think it's something that can really help improve all of our businesses right now if you get more comfortable on the phones. Um, especially in this time when we're not spending as much time face-to-face, -face, we need to get better at sales presentations and actually just in prospecting, just getting on the phone and, and uh, prospecting and making cold calls. Um, I'm not gonna exhaust this page. There's a link at the bottom for where I found this list and there's lots of content around each of those bullet items under prospecting. Cold calling in particular is one of those prospecting techniques that can really improve uh, your business. And again, I'm gonna lean back on Brian Tracy for just a second. He talks about a technique called uh, 100 calls, a 100 call method. 
And uh, when you get this document, if you follow this link, I'm not sure what this is gonna do on my screen share, so let's give this a quick try. Yeah, it looks like you can still see this. What he recommends doing is, um, and here's just a very short article out of his blog on how to do this. You basically um, take all the pressure off of yourself and not worry about closing a single call of your first 100 calls, of your next 100 calls. Give yourself a challenge. You're gonna make 20 calls a day for the next five days, for instance, and call potential prospects without any pressure of whether or not they buy from you. All you're gonna do is practice uh, that cold call technique and practice a couple things that I'm gonna show you in the next slide or two. It's a, it's a scary thing to try because you're thinking, oh my gosh, I could be giving up all kinds of potential work. I could, you know, I'm gonna completely blow this and flub up the calls and I'm gonna, you know, destroy a hundred relationships. And it turns out when the pressure's off, you actually do better. And when your prospects uh, on the other end of the phone hear that you're not <laughs> as nervous, you've taken some pressure off of yourself, you're not as concerned about uh, making the sale, the call actually goes smoother and you will get some work out of those first hundred calls. So it's a very interesting technique. I challenge you to give it a try. I have done it before and it works. Um, I've done it a couple times here in the chamber. The next step in that process, in the seven step process, is building a rapport with your potential uh, clients. There's lots of techniques and lots of ways to build a rapport. I shouldn't say technique because you really do need to be genuine. Uh, it's not, you really need to work on improving your own um, likability and empathetic listening. You know, um, Michael talked about this last week under the leadership component about being a good listener. That's part of building a rapport with somebody. Um, I'm not gonna exhaust any more there. Once you've built a rapport with somebody, you can begin to pull questions from them and begin to understand and identify needs that they might have and whether or not you're listening for ways that um, your products and services can fill their needs. But the key is to really identify the prospect's needs. Something called three by three research is um, a whole bunch of fun. Give yourself three minutes to learn to search online and learn three facts about somebody before you call them, before you cold call. And that sounds difficult. How in the world do you learn three things about somebody in three minutes? Social media profiles are make us an open book. Um, search somebody's name, look for their phone number, and you're going to find their LinkedIn profile. You'll figure out where they went to school, how long they've been in their current job, um, some of their interests, and look for some things in common between all of that. You know, you might have both graduated from college the same year, opposite ends of the country, doesn't matter. Maybe it's the same degree, and et cetera. Um, maybe you're both into hiking or dog grooming or, you know, who knows, whatever other special interest might show up. Um, but challenge yourself three minutes find three facts, and then pick up the phone so that you know you've got some connection. Do some research, again, a three by three research on the company that you're calling. And this is an interesting thing that I stumbled into this morning. I haven't tried this yet. I can't wait to try this for a cold call. I wanna be able to, to start out with a hypothesis of need and say, you know, I've been doing some research on your company, this is Prospect, and what I've learned about your company is blah, blah, blah. And I think trends in the industry that you're in look like blah, blah, blah. Did I get that correct? Um, you know, did I find the right number of employees for your business? Have you really been in business 15 years? Show that you've done some research and you understand a little bit about where that company is and, and their needs. And then start asking some open questions. The key to identifying needs, especially if you're doing this in a cold call, <laughs> you really don't wanna just cold call and start asking a, a thousand questions. But if you can open up a door and do nothing more than set an appointment for uh, that discovery session or for that identifying needs session, uh, make that a second phone call and make sure you get that scheduled before you hang up from the cold call. And then spend a 30 minute conversation just discovering needs and separate that from doing your demonstration. In other words, start out with a discovery session and then book yet another appointment for your demonstration. 
because your demonstration is going to be much more fine-tuned to describe how your business meets the deeds that you think you've uncovered and that they've shared with you that they really have. Um, there's a couple hyperlinks for a couple more places to go dig some more on, on this, these topics. Uh, when you finally do a presentation and you get, it's probably gonna be your third conversation with this person, at least a third. Um, keep your presentation very short, 15 minutes. Uh, try to tell a story in the process. Only cover the few things that you know you can help them solve and then stop. I'm guilty of this myself of not doing this and I can't wait to practice this. And I, this is something I picked up this morning um, as I'm thinking about my own sales process for the chamber. We have an array of 20 benefits that we offer a, a customer, a, a potential chamber member. And when I'm on a one-to-one a, uh, -one with a prospect, I'm trying to shove through all 18, 20 benefits. And uh, instead, I need to spend a little more time, that first 30 minutes doing a needs assessment, schedule a second call, and say, you know what, out of the 18 or 20 things that we do for our businesses, I think these three are gonna help you meet your needs the best. All right, and then at that point, shut up, just stop. And look for them throughout the presentation, whether or not you're hitting the mark, Learn to read body language, learn to you know, listen empathetically. The 60 second rule is something else that's in this, was mentioned in this link that's at the bottom here on, under the sources. The 60 second rule is, and I've really broken it because I've been at this for, <laughs> for about 12 minutes now. Uh, the 60 second rule basically says, give a little bit of your pitch and ask an open question and stop. And make sure you don't talk more than 30, 60 seconds without uh, stopping, taking a breath, and asking for some feedback about how you're doing. Does that make sense? Say like that. But then actually listening for a response. Um, quit while you're ahead is a very important point as well. And I know there are many sales, many new members that could have joined the chamber that I've lost um, by not stopping when I'm ahead. When I get a sales a buying trigger, Somebody says, you know, everything you're doing here sounds great. How much does it cost? At that point, I need to shut up and, and ask for a credit card because at that point, they've made a buying decision. As soon as they ask how much this is, they're ready to move. And if you, if you don't respect that buy signal and you say, well, I've got eight more things I got to show you first before, you know, I'll give you the price, but I'm not ready for your credit card because I need to go do these things. You end up blowing the sale. I know from personal experience, I've done that more than once. Um, and I've recognized that I just need to learn to, to stop when I'm ahead. Um, and always make sure you get the next appointment scheduled or the next step. Overcoming objections can become a study in and of itself. You can spend, again, hours, a couple hours a day for the next month um, practicing and learning how to overcome objections. If you make a list of the standard objections you hear about your business, about what people typically say why they don't buy, and then you're prepared with responses, uh, that is so critical to be prepared to overcome objections. Don't ever let the first objection be a reason why you stop pursuing an individual or, or company in your sales cycle, in your sales process. They typically say that about six objections is a point where somebody is just completely exhausted and can't come up with something else, um, another reason to not buy, and eventually they will purchase if you can overcome up to six objections. Um, price is always at the top of the list. Complacency is an interesting objection. Um, you know, we've been doing this for 15 years. We've been using the same vendor. We're happy with them, right? Um, we're not going to make a change or fear of change sounds a little bit like complacency. You know, we've been using the same vendor for 15 years. We hate them and they're too expensive, but we know what we, we know what we're getting and we know what to expect. I'm afraid to take a move. You know, you'll hear that come out in different twists or you're a relatively new company. And I'm not sure that I trust you yet because I've trusted XYZ forever. Right? So how do I know that what's gonna what you're gonna deliver is is true and what you're telling me is true um you can overcome that with testimonials by the way and five-star reviews and other 
other ways to overcome trust. Family connections and promises are really tough to overcome. You know, I'm not gonna buy um, a house from you, Jennifer, because my sister-in-law is a realtor. <laughs> it's a tough one to overcome, but you need to be ready to respond to that, right? Um, or, you know, I've been working with another realtor who's promising to find the perfect house for me. So, you know, I'm stuck with the person that's been promising. And you gotta learn how to overcome that next objection. External input is always fun. My wife and I love to use each other for this. Um, you know, everything you just presented to me, Mr. Salesperson, is incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I need to talk it over with my wife, and I'll be back. I'll get back to you in a couple of days. External input is a, is an objection that you will get on a regular basis. Um, or this isn't the right time. You know, we just made a purchase, or we don't have the budget right now, or the zombie apocalypse is here, and we have to wait 60 to 90 to 180 days. Right? There's always a timing of objection. So be prepared for those. There are some techniques for overcoming objections besides knowing what they're going to be. You need to learn to listen fully to what the objection is. Understand completely. Don't try to answer it while they're in the middle of their sentence. Really leverage your listening skills more than you normally would. This is the, this is the main place that you really need to be a good listener. Repeat back what you think you understand is the objection and then have the appropriate response and test to make sure that you've answered it appropriately. And once you turn through five or six of those, they're not gonna have anything left. They're not gonna have another reason to not purchase from you at some point. Um, there are lots of different closing techniques. Again, Brian Tracy, my buddy says there are, uh, my hero says that there are at least 24 closing techniques. He has books written on the art of closing. They all sort of fall into a handful of categories. Um, and here's a list of six, seven categories. Uh, so the now or never close. This is your time to say, you know, this is the last one at this price. I can't let any more go out the door at this price. We're going to have to, you know, the next one's going to be a hundred bucks more. Or are you going to make a decision now? Um, there are all sorts of versions of the now or never closes that you can test or practice with. Summary closes are fun. You know, just recap everything you just covered. When would you like to take delivery on this? And when you attest some of these closes, you will start seeing more objections popping up. But if you've addressed all the objections, it's tougher for someone to, to walk away. Uh, the sharp angle close. I do this now, some. I also do some, um, I guess it doesn't quite fit in here. There's another technique I've been using with the chamber that's worked on my last to new chamber members, as a matter of fact. Uh, the sharp angle is interesting. So somebody will ask you for, ask me in particular with the chamber, do you offer any discounts? Can I get this for $100 less? What kind of a special are you running right now? And it's easy for me to overcome that objection by saying rather than discounting our price, because we know what we're doing is worth $3.95 a year, I can either give you a $100 uh, uh, banner ad if you sign up now or um, extend your membership for three extra months and give you 15 months for the cost of 12. So that becomes kind of this either or closing technique or either or test. And I don't see that in this list, it probably should be there. Um, but if you ask them, which would you prefer? They're making a commitment. They would prefer one or the other, but as soon as they tell you which one they prefer, that becomes a sharp angle. I can do that for you now, but I need your credit card number now. Right? And I don't do that. I need to test, give that a try. Um, and if they're asking for the discount, sure, I can give it to you, but I need you to make a, make a sign on the dotted line here. I'm going to give that a try. Um, referrals are always an important part of the process as well. And if you can learn how to ask for referrals on a regular basis and actually build a whole system around referrals, um, there's some tips here and there's another link at the bottom from the Thrive Hive on how to build a whole referral engine into your business. So out of all of that, out of all of those seven major steps or major stages, again, Brian Tracy suggests if you spend 80% of your time, six hours out of every eight hour day, between prospecting, presenting, and closing, you're gonna have a huge, huge impact on your business. 
um, just focusing on those, you have, obviously have to fill in the blanks. You have to be able to build rapport and identify needs and overcome objections and referrals and all that stuff. But if 80% of your day is focused on those three activities, your business has to improve. <laughs> there's, there's no way around it. Uh, it's going to work if you're, if you're doing all those things correctly. I'm going to stop sharing the screen at this point. Um, and I'm going to open up for questions or comments. Um, I covered an awful lot of information and I'm going to get that posted up, that file added to the chat box here in just a second. Um, so now it's time for me to shut up. Thoughts? Comments? I mean, when it comes to sales prospecting, like nobody really likes making the phone calls, but I like how you're talking about the first hundred not focusing on, um, you know, necessarily getting a sale. And, and one thing that I always like to do when I'm starting off on something new is I make a throwaway list. So it's like a list of people where it's like, I don't care if they buy or not, like if they buy great, but they're not like, you know, million dollar deals. And the first like 15, I like purposefully try and get them to hang up on me. I swear to God, it works because then you're like, you're so over the embarrassment that it doesn't matter the rest of the calls. Right. And if 15 works for you, that's impressive. Um, and Brian suggests, Brian Tracy suggests 100. But uh, 15 throwaways, that's a good tip. Anyone else? Hi, Tom. Um, I really liked your presentation a lot. It had a, a, a lot of really good uh, points. Uh, being in the bookkeeping industry, one that I, I totally agree with the 60 second and the quit while you're ahead, because when people call me, they call me because they want a bookkeeper. There's no magical fairy dust from one bookkeeper to the other. We all do the same thing. Um, so it's just stopping this is the one key for me. But the biggest uh, thing I usually get is um, my wife does the bookkeeping my sister does the bookkeeping so what we also offer when that comes up is we offer classes we have a set fee for three classes they're an hour long each that we spread them out so we don't overwhelm people and we give you an overview so we've kind of throughout the years tried to find a way to pivot through the different comebacks we get like that so but i um, i appreciate you putting this on that's a great way to overcome objections by simply saying, uh, by offering training to their bookkeeper. Brilliant, brilliant. I'd like to kind of piggyback on that too. I think part of the presentation should be essentially knowing what your client could object to and incorporating those into your presentation so that you get less objections because most people can't handle the objections and they fall apart. So if you try to incorporate those and then show your value inside your presentation, you get less objections on the back end and it makes it easier to roll into. Okay. So when do you want me to start this for you? Uh, that's my two cents on the subject. That's a great tip. And I've heard that before and I forgot to include that in today's presentation. Uh, but I have heard that exactly. Um, you know, a lot of people think that we're, we're expensive and you know, you just jump right into it. You know, you're going to get a price objection. So you just deal with it. You know, we're more expensive than our competitors and you're, and you're going to see in a few minutes why. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, good answer, Zach. Tom, technically, aren't we cheaper than the other chambers, too? I'm sorry, what was that, Ryan? Aren't we technically less expensive than the other chambers anyways? Um, I think we fall about in line. Uh, the one person that can answer that for us right now on this call would be John McCombs, who belongs to a handful of chambers um, and does a lot of a lot of networking and a lot of um, comparison shopping. So I know that John has, has told me in the past, um, at one point he thought we were high, at another point he, he said we were in line. Um, I think it depends on the value prop too, is why I position us. But John, do you have a perspective on that? I, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a moving part, moving measurement. Uh, there, there are chamber memberships uh, that are non-traditional space that are, when I say that, not tied to a geographical area or municipality. Um, your North Phoenix is probably right around in the line. 
you know, I, I, uh, you know, right now I'd say North Phoenix has a pretty good value proposition because for North Phoenix Chambers, the, the one having meetings and is doing things, um, you know, the, the Scottsdale, the Glendale and Peoria just really aren't doing too much right now. And so, so, I mean, I, I, I kind of told some folks, well, Hey, you should check out North Phoenix right now because the price is right to check them out and they're doing something while these others aren't. So hope I answered the question. Yeah, no, I, and my point would just be like, you know, setting that price point ahead of time in the presentation. Like, look, if you go to these other chambers, here's what you're going to get and here's what they offer that, or here's what we offer that they don't. Great. Harrison, you came off mute there. Yeah, something that I've done in the past, because I mean, I get objections daily and everything, even people who want to buy whatever insurance it is that we're presenting still just feel the need to give some sort of objection. Um, so something I've done for the longest time is anything you get an objection, I always write it down and then kind of write down a way I overcame it. And then I'm able to kind of go back and read those. So that way I'm always prepared and have a response that I'm used to, or if it's a new objection, write it down again and start thinking of some ideas of, okay, how can I overcome this in the future? That way, you have something somewhat memorized to go, oh, that's the objection you're going to give me? Perfect. I have 20 different ways I've written down how I'm going to overcome this. And so it just comes right off the memory and super easy and smooth to kind of go into. Yeah, and role playing is a huge part of that too, right? Harrison, do you do role play at all with anybody that you work with, sales guys? Yeah, no, definitely. Me and a couple other agents definitely go back and forth with some different objections and getting kind of the opinion of peers is huge in all industries just because just because I might think I have something great they might have another idea and just kind of bouncing ideas back and forth it makes it almost like muscle memory so when somebody says something you can take a pause you don't get worked up you just answer the way you're used to answering right and that makes it seem flawless so yeah it doesn't come off in a bad way it comes off great and then they think okay this guy knows what he's talking about and they, they exactly right. respect it and I think like also, while it's good to not have a script, like it's really good to have talking points. Like don't just go in without any sort of material in front of you because like, even though you don't want to read it verbatim, well, Mr. Prospect X, Y, Z, like you still want to have a reference and like something to jog your memory in case you get stuck. Yep. I also believe, and I think it was on one of your um, slides there, Tom, it's, um, it's how you make people feel, you know, if they're comfortable with you, they, they won't mind spending the extra, it's not, it boils down to how comfortable, do, at least for my industry, how comfortable do they feel? I could say all the right things and I could do all the right things. And if they're not comfortable with me, they're just going to move on. And I think also a big part is to know when to say, okay, you know, I mean, well, I know we all want the sale, but it's that uh, being too pushy, I think is also a complete turn off, you know, so, cause they'll always come back. They always come back. Just let them go. They'll come back. <laughs> and I think part of that too is understanding the, um, an ideal customer and, and, and having that profile in mind in the first place. And when you start out and if somebody doesn't want to pull the trigger and doesn't think they can afford you or don't want to waste their time with you or whatever your the vibe is, whatever their objection is, it's easy to let them go because they're not a good prospect. If they don't see the value in what you're doing, that has to be one of the criteria for, for a, good, a good fit. Yeah, I agree with what everybody said, even Irene, her last comment. I work my business, uh, most of who I work with is referral based. So I have, I can name off the top of my head, my top three people who I know would refer me to others, you know, looking to buy or sell their house. And for me, it's a comfortability in how we gel with one another. So I'm much more 
open and can represent someone who's going to be more mind-like than me. And there are times when I'm definitely going to turn people away if we're just not going to work well together because it's just going to make it painful from day one to closing date. And I'm okay with that. And not many people are, and they're going to take on whoever, but I'm not to say I'm super picky, but I'm definitely need to, to be able to, you know, gel with someone when I work with them. There's a lot to be said for not looking desperate. Yeah, wow. exactly. Do most of you start out with a, a phone call as your first contact or, you know, phone call, leave a message and follow up email or do you some, my philosophy is, and granted my business is a little bit different, but I figure I can send like 20 emails while I'm doing something else out to somebody for the first time and then make a follow-up phone call? I don't like to send emails unless I've spoken to somebody. I don't know if anybody else has that. I just, if I got an email from somebody I've never spoken to, it's an instant delete. I don't yeah. read it at all. I would, I would agree that like, I never send an email first. Like mm -hmm. maybe if I've met them at a networking event or like we've had a phone call before, but like my first initiation is always going to be a phone call or a meeting in person. Yeah. Yep. It's phone call, phone call and immediate text afterward. And then an email just saying, hey, I followed up via um, phone call, text, and then an email. And then usually after a few times, if I get nothing, then I just, you just have to stop because it's not worth their time or your time. But you do continue to once a month make contact with them. Um, I usually, uh, when they, when I, um, when they reach out to me, I get as many um, key points about their business and what they're looking for. And then I usually do an initial consultation, which is free. I would prefer uh, in person, but because you kind of get a sense of the person, because so I do have clients that I've never met before. I don't even know what they're lo they look like, but uh, they've been my client for seven years now and they're great, you know, but uh, just that one-on-one, -on -one, always the first time is where we try to go first. Okay. So Jennifer, you just triggered a thought for me, and I don't know that um, we've talked about that here at all in this call today. CRMs, mm -hmm. and contact management systems, and right. how do people generally keep up on those uh, ticklers? You've got to have some kind of a tickler system that says, touch this person again in 30 days, touch this person again in 45. Right. And some documentation of the conversations you've had up to that point. Mm -hmm. um, for me, when I first started in the business, it was just old school spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet. And I always documented when I spoke with them. I try to detail um, as much as I can about them from a personality perspective, what they were looking for in a home, who, how many kids they had, you know, do they have a wife, you know, anniversaries, birthdays, whatever information I could get to them or get from them. So the next time I talked with them, I'll say, you know, how was that family vacation you took last month? I heard you went to blah, blah, blah. You know, how did that go? And then they're like, oh my gosh, I can't remember. I can't believe you remembered ask about that or you remembered that period. Um, right now I've transitioned to more of a real estate CRM and I use um, Lion Desks specifically. And so from there, I've just built in my system um, updates. I'll do something at least once a month, but there are agents that will touch base with people on a weekly basis. Um, some will do a newsletter every week, um, which I think is a little bit overkill in my opinion, because I will usually tell people to go to my social media page where they can get the most updated information, but it's at least I touch people once a month regardless and always holidays. So there's at least 24 times a year that I'm touching base with them, sometimes twice a month, just, you know, every, every holiday, you name it. And it's not salesy. I'm not doing sales at all. I'm just saying, hi, how are things going? But there will be sprinkles of, hey, if you're looking to buy or sell, and it's not in particular for that person, it's who do you know that's looking to buy or sell? I, like can totally... I think CRMs are a great source. Oh, Mike, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm fine. Go ahead, Zach. Oh. Uh, I was just saying, I think CRMs are awesome, especially if you have a great huge list uh, of people that you're trying to get in touch or keep in touch.
with. Um, if you're not willing to spend the money on it or your client base is a lot smaller, I think just an Excel file like Jennifer, uh, sorry, not Jennifer, right? Yeah, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, I'm sorry, um, an Excel file. And then I use my Outlook just to set an appointment there. And then I make my notes in there, just date it every time and then just keep outdating it. Every touch point, I just outdated it a month or a uh, six months and then just every time I'm back in there and it pops up I make my notes again as I call them so it works for me so far CRM systems if you can afford them are awesome see I have I have an unpopular opinion on CRMs I think that they're too bulky and I don't really like them so <clears throat> if anybody doesn't want to use the CRM I actually use an Excel spreadsheet for like non-hot leads once a lead becomes hot and it's something that I'm actually working actively it, it goes on to Trello uh, Ryan, I agree with you when it comes to um, customer management programs like that. I've never used one because I didn't really, when I think of customer management programs, I feel like 200 clients, right? So what I did start using this year was a software called Asana, which is kind of like Monday.com where it keeps you organized. So I've similar to Trello. Made, pardon? It's really similar to Trello. It's like a awesome. project management. Yep. yep. And I just created a folder in there called Kuffner Bookkeeping, you know, and I have my tasks, what I need to do as Kuffner Bookkeeping, not any of my clients, which includes call, you know, the power, port, the power partners on this day and call leads on this day. And then uh, just like Jennifer said, we usually sent out um, holiday cards or event cards that are like, we just sent out, um, quarantine cards to our clients that had um, uh, crossword puzzles on them um, for a company called send cards out or send out cards, send out cards.com. And you just make them and they send them, you put your credit card, set it and forget it. It's done. And then I tell them, you know, what word did you find first? You know, and then I'll get them to your social media, hopefully <laughs> to say, Hey, my first word was blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so that's what we do. And the nice thing that I like about project management is because I have a team and I, I'm actually usually delegating a lot of stuff, I can move them through that process and then start assigning tasks and then delegate those tasks to my team. Yep. And that's why Trello works really well for you, Ryan, because you've got the Kanban, you know, especially if you're doing some kind of a methodology for tracking a project and nurturing a, a prospect through the system is a project. Absolutely, that's a, that's a great approach. Irene, I think you just had the hottest tip of the day. I'm Is gonna call that the hardest? hottest tip of the month until somebody comes up with something better. A way to use send out cards to address the quarantining to, wow. But to, not in a negative way. People don't wanna hear how to wash their hands or anything like that. They just wanna know that you're, you know, but you Here's gave them something, something to fun to do and, it, and to interact with your social, I'm sorry, you gave them something fun to do and to interact with your social media. That's right. amazing. That's the trick. It wasn't, it wasn't that you were calling out how bad things are. Mm -hmm. I did say, if you guys need to talk, you know, we're always here, but you know. <laughs> awesome. 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 Any other thoughts or comments? We're, uh, two or three minutes away from uh, wrapping up and stopping the recording. So, any other last thoughts? Yes. Make sure that when you're going into calls, you don't feel like you're annoying them. Like, I think that that's like one of the worst mistakes that people make is they're like, oh, I'm bugging them. I'm taking time out of their day. Just go in confident and like call more often than you need, think you need to. Yes, that's a great tip. I have a quick question. I don't know if it's actually a quick answer. Um, how, how, how many times do you guys say, okay, I'm going to call this person three times, six times, nine times before I stop calling them or contacting them? Like what, how do you determine what is enough? Enough is enough. <laughs> like Ryan mentioned, don't, don't annoy them. You know, it's like, no, I just, I think don't go in thinking that you're annoying them. Right. Um, but I mean, it takes seven touches if you're calling. It takes more than that if you're not calling. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, anything less than like 10, you haven't done your job. 
because because I've had clients where, or p- potential clients where I've I've emailed, I've called, and I spread it out within like three four weeks. You know, I don't want to do it constantly. And then at the moment I just say, you know what, they're fine. It's okay. I, s- I send an email saying we're always here when you're ready and mm-hmm. do the closure. And then they like call me like two weeks later. Right. Yeah. I mean, you just <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. Like, people you have to meet people where they're at and so just you know staying on them is important um you never know because people can hop out of and into your sales cycle at any point so it's like just Mm -hmm. frequently trying to contact them and figure out where they're at um i've had people that i've called like every day for like three weeks and then you know nothing and then like a couple months later they called me back and bought something from me so barry's come off mute what do you have barry well, one of the things that I do is um, that's been very successful for me is when I get the phone call and I get the tone or any resistance, you know, I actually, I just sort of flaunt it and I say, you know, I'm sorry to be a pest, but I'm here to help. And normally when you say that, then they'll go overboard and tell you that they're, you're not a pest really, and then they'll tell you what's going on in their world. Like, well, you know, I've just had, you know, someone didn't show up for work today, or, you know, I ran over my dog, or whatever it is that put them in the mindset that they're being resistant to your call, they'll usually um, disclose it. And to this date, I've never had someone say, oh, yeah, you are a pest. Don't call me. So one of the things, it's sort of like with objections, you brag about objections, in which we talked about this earlier, uh, because if you bring it up versus them thinking it, and that's the worst thing, is if they're thinking of an objection and you're not hearing it, then you don't have anything to work with. As a matter of fact, if, if you get people that are all complimentary, oh, I love you, you know, and I, you know, and everything's great, and I know you do such a good job, those are usually problematic calls because they're just sort of shining you on to get rid of you. So objections are good, number one, and, and, I, and I put a little sticker on my screen, um, in a while I don't do it anymore, but in my early days, I, when I'm making phone calls. Objections are good. You want objections because it gives you something to work with. And again, just to reiterate, if you get a resistance in the phone call, just say, you know, hey, I'm sorry, don't mean to be a pest. And then you have to shut up though <laughs> and let them interject why you're not being a pest or they may just say, you know, you caught me at a bad time. And then you can just piggyback, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what would be a good time to follow up with you? And then they give you a date and time. And then that's how you start your next call. And you say, hey, John, you know, you asked me to call you today. And, and then you follow through with your presentation, what you wanted to talk to him about. So that's my Good words stuff. of wisdom. All good. All good. Uh, leaving, leaving voicemail messages. If you're cold calling, do you leave a voicemail message? Depends. Really? I, I do every single time. Yeah, every time. I, it's a huge pet peeve of my husband. If I don't leave a voicemail, he was just like, no, no. Because how would they know to call you back? I mean, I know See, it's so, your ID, but... So that's the thing. I I think it depends on like where they're at in your sales process. Like if you've made contact and they know who you are, great. Um, Cold call was cold call was my question, Ryan. Yeah. So if it's a cold call, they have no clue who I am and they have no clue what my company is. The first three calls, I'm not going to leave them voicemail because I don't want them to like automatically assume that I'm not worth talking to and then purposefully dodge my call. And so See, and I, I feel like I just, I leave a voicemail to have them call me back. It doesn't matter if they know who I am. If they call me back, great. I'll tell them who I am and then pitch it at that point to try to set that appointment or a later date. But I'm, I don't sell anything that first call in the voicemail. I just leave them my name, my number. Hey, give me a call, please. I, I need to talk to you about something. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's fine. Like, and sometimes I will do that. I mean, it really just depends. Like there's, I guess I feel things out more than anything. 
My feeling on Ed Zach is that you've um, given up control over being able to call them back because now we, so you leave a message, hey, my name is Zach, give me a call. When you get this message, it's important to talk to you. You don't hear from them for three days, right? If you call them back, it's odd now. Hey, you ignored my last message, right? You start coming across as that guy. No, um, and I don't, I don't well, see that as a problem because if I'm able to actually say that to somebody and I'm like, I got them on the phone, I'm like, hey, you didn't get back to me last time. It generally puts them in a place to feel awkward enough that they're just going to stay on the phone with me long enough to at least let me put my points in. So that's okay. And, and if it, if it is an issue, hey, it, it's an issue, but I'm, you know, the no or the objection on their end is, is their problem. It's not mine. Like if from a sales point of view and cold calls, like all I'm trying to do is get my name out and get people to know who I am. So. Yeah. I I actually kind of piggyback off that. Like it also kind of goes back to what Barry was saying about like the pestering them and things is when I leave voicemails, I always kind of set the expectations in the sense of like, Hey, I'm calling you because I know this is something you were interested in or could really use. Um, so I'm gonna give you a call back next week if I don't hear back from you um, to see if I can catch you at a better time. So look forward to either hearing back from you sooner or in case scenario, I'll touch base with you again next week. So I'm setting the expectations. So even if I'm pestering them, they know the call's coming because I left it right there in the voicemail. You will get yeah. it. Yeah. 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 I, I, I do not return uh, a call unless somebody leaves a voicemail. So I always leave a voicemail and I follow up and let them know in the voicemail that, hey, I'm going to drop you an email. So if they're more comfortable either calling me back or, or conversing over email, um, you know, giving them, giving a, a potential client an option. Well, and, and I think that when you're cold calling and you're trying to prospect, like I, in every step, if I'm leaving a voicemail, leaving an email, I make it clear that there's something else coming, like either way. Like, so it, even if you want, even if you don't want to talk to me, that's fine. Just tell me no so I can stop. And Ryan, you're, you're not wrong at all by thinking that voicemails aren't the way to get, like I've worked with other guys that do sales and they don't leave voicemails at all unless the person knows who they are and they, they're doing great. So it's not one way or the other. I think it's just different perspective. That's all. You know, Tom, um, uh, I don't remember her name with uh, green tech Ruth Penny. Penny Sanders. Yep. Penny Sand Sanders uh, had recommended this up. You can't see it. Let me see if I get closer. Nope, you can't see it. Sorry. It's uh, the power of the dream with Larry Larson, that event she went to. And one of the things he had mentioned is uh, he was sharing a story that when he came, he, he sent out an email to potential leads and the subject line was referral. Now I don't do any called call calling, you know, at all, but what if you left a voicemail saying, call me back, I have an opportunity for a referral. Is that, I mean, that, that could work too, maybe. And the referral is get to know each other so you can refer business. That actually works really well. Um, I've learned a lot from Larry over the years and I've used um, that technique. In fact, Larry has um, told a lot of people that I was probably one of the only people that he's taught that to that dove into LinkedIn and using it for my second tier connections and building, uh, moving from second tier to first because of using exactly that technique. I'm reaching out to you for the purpose of referrals. Please contact me. Um, because, you're right. Because at the end of the day, I mean, we're all referring each other, you know, I mean, Hey, if one of you needs a bookkeeper, that's awesome. But it's referring each other's services and, you know, whatever those services may be, whether it's a nonprofit, maybe we have people that can donate here, check out, you know, Joanne with Singleton and, or dream dinners right now with the crisis of can't find food, we'll have dream dinners, take care of your meals or, you know, insurance, whatever the, the AC, the heat's coming. So whatever the situation is, you're always, uh, able to refer somebody and I am putting a link to that card app. It's called sendoutcards.com. I'll put it in the chat for whoever wants 